Hello everyone and a warm welcome to this week's Everton show. The players have been away this week for some warm weather training. And of course there's no game this weekend for the Blues after we lost in the Capital One Cup semi-final and our scheduled Premier League opponents this weekend won through. But there's still much to discuss on this week's show, including our progress in the FA Cup, all in the company of Graeme Stewart. Good afternoon to you, Graeme. It was a comfortable, routine victory against Bournemouth, wasn't it? Just what we needed. It was what we needed. Um, that's all we can ask for, a nice routine away performance. The majority of our away performances have been the better ones this season. So when the draw came out of the hat, I wasn't upset in you know any uh, way, shape, or form, and I thought we'd win the game. And Ross got that. Uh, Ross got the goal and put us ahead. And that was uh, was always going to be one way traffic from them. I, th I feel an element of good fortune about Ross's goal because it took a deflection off Dan Gosling. But goodness me, we were due a little bit of good luck, weren't we? Well, yeah. I mean, people talk about having a bit of luck in the cup, but. You know, Ross has got that capability in and around the box to get, you know, shuffle the ball onto either foot and to get his shots off. We've seen it numerous times this season. He took his chance. We got a little bit of luck and it ended up in the back of the net and set us on our way. And Dan Gosling of all people. <laughs> Plenty more FA Cup discussion to come this evening and we'll be joined a little later on, by the way, by Andy Spence, who is in his second spell as the manager of Everton Ladies. We'll also hear from these people. We are learning our lessons, we were growing all the time and that was another factor that I was very pleased today. We got a two goal lead again like we did a few months ago in the Premier League and I think we showed the lesson learned and very pleased with that aspect. You know, a fantastic amount travelled all this way and as it's been in the cup competition previously in the, in the League Cup, uh, fantastic support and thankfully uh, we've given something to, good to go on with today. I was here for a short period of time. Um, I loved every minute of it. You know, you became in, you know, part of the fabric of the club, you know, the supporters and the staff and everybody. Well, after suffering a penalty scare, Everton were always in control at Bournemouth last weekend and few would argue that we thoroughly deserved our 2-0 win. After the game, Roberto Martinez was a very contented man. Well, I thought it was a, a, a really important football occasion and we knew that. We, we had a, an incredible away stand packed of Evertonians. I thought we started uh, really bright, probably the first five, six minutes. I thought we settled in really well into the game. Um, from that point on, we were strong off the ball and good concentration, but on the ball probably is the worst that we've been away from home this season. We were sloppy, wasteful, we couldn't show any real intent. And, Joel Robles makes a big save in the penalty, which uh, allows us to get a kick start in the in the second half. If you want, of course, it still was a, a long period from from the penalty until the end of the game. But uh, a goal lead for Bournemouth at that point, with no real chances, it would have been a a, a big a big boost for them. I thought the second half was completely different. We carry on with a good concentration and defending really well, but on the ball we had very good intent, we saw things a lot easier, we became uh, a real threat and obviously Ross, to see Ross at the end of that shot again, uh, it, it was very pleasing to see uh, some big performances from certain individuals when we most needed it. Uh, we are learning our lessons, we were growing all the time and that was another factor that I was very pleased today. We got a two goal lead again like we did a few months ago in the Premier League and I think we showed the lesson learned and how we managed the game from that point on and even we could have got maybe another good opportunity or two. Uh, I'm very pleased with that with that aspect. We adapted to to a very poor first half on the ball. That for our standard that was quite poor. Second half was was a, a very dominant performance which got the, the right reward and now we can all look forward to the quarterfinals of this competition. Well, last weekend's win at Bournemouth in the FA Cup was the perfect way for Phil Jagielka to celebrate his own personal milestone. The skipper made his 600th senior professional appearance down at the Vitality Stadium and after the game he spoke to Everton TV. We probably didn't play as well as we would have wanted first half. The conditions were a little bit difficult and obviously uh, giving away a, a, a needless penalty but thankfully Joel's obviously done his homework and a, and a fantastic save. That was a pivotal moment in the game, wasn't it? Because it really gave the travelling Evertonians something to cheer about. Yeah, definitely. They were they were loud throughout the night. But you know, when a goalkeeper makes a save like that, it, it gives them a, you know a bit more emphasis to keep shouting and keep going. And obviously, we we were second towards them second half. They had you know quite a bit of us down that area, and obviously scoring the two goals in front of them um, meant they weren't quiet for the whole afternoon. And you know, a fantastic amount travelled all this way. And as it's been in the cup competition previously in the in the League Cup, uh, fantastic support and. 
thankfully uh, we've given them something to, good to go on with tonight. Bournemouth had their moments, which you'd expect. Yeah, definitely. They they freshen things up. Um, obviously, they've got a, a pretty decent squad. They've spent some okay money um, under the radar a little bit, and they're together in the show today. Uh, they they changed quite a few uh, players around, but their system worked. They caused us a few problems, but thankfully, um, I wouldn't say Joel had his busiest of days. It was a case of trying to stop things at source, and thankfully, uh, the penalty save, and then that was it really for him. Such a fortune about the first goal when it came off Dan Gosling of all people, but uh, the intent was there from Ross. He opened up his body. He knew what he was going to do. Yeah, definitely. Um, you sort of think it's your night when something like that happens. You know, they they sometimes can loop over. Obviously, they had a free kick which deflected. I'm not sure if it was off Rom. That probably went about a yard wide. So uh, small margins in these games, but you know, we're thankful it was it was our day today. And a clever corner routine for the second. <laughs> yeah, put in the mix, everyone away. Then Rom sort of tap it in. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure he'll take the credit for that, but. Uh, so it was a frustrating night for a few of us and things like that, but it was nice for Rom, for Rom to get on the score sheet. Nice for Umar to make his Everton debut as well. Yeah, come on, I thought him and Kev, uh, for the short period they came on, uh, helped us massively, gave us that little bit more emphasis towards the end, obviously to see out the 2-0 and say it's nice for him to get a bit of experience and hopefully um, you know, the squads can stick together now and have a good second half, well, second sort of third third to the season, should I say, and uh, something for the fans uh, to smile about. Graham, 600 senior appearances for the skipper and he's still going strong. He is very strong. Uh, no coincidence that he's come back into the side and we're keeping clean sheets. Um, you know, you don't play 600 games at this kind of level unless you're a consistent team player um, and your levels of fitness are excellent as well. So long may that continue for Jags. We mentioned before that we had a little touch of long overdue good fortune with, uh, with Ross's goal. Did we get a little bit more good fortune with the penalty because it was James McCarthy on a yellow card yeah. who controlled the ball with his arm? I think that was the big stri stroke of luck that we've had um, because he, the, another referee on another given day could easily have sent Jamesy off. Um, when it comes to the penalty, that's not luck. Joel mm. stands big in the goal. He's a dominant figure. He goes left, makes the save, and it's a pivotal moment in the game. Terrific save, wasn't it? Pivotal moments in our FA Cup run. Well, I had a new face alongside me in the commentary box down at Bournemouth last weekend, but it was a familiar face nonetheless. James Beattie was once Everton's record signing when he joined the club from Southampton back in 2005. And as he lives no more than a few minutes away from Bournemouth, he was an ideal alternative as my FA Cup co-commentator, given the mid-season warm weather absence of Graham Stewart. <laughs> and I may regret that. James himself enjoyed it. And he, as he told us afterwards, he also enjoyed the result. He uh, started the game off a little bit slowly um, and didn't really penetrate Bournemouth's defence, allowed him to get back and, and back into formation and found it difficult because there was lack of movement up front in the first half, if we're, if we're being honest, and uh, found a couple of opportunities to cross the ball out wide, but then decided to come back inside. Lukaku was getting frustrated, so I think at half-time, uh, words along those lines were, were portrayed to the players and probably between the self, they probably knew themselves, you know, but from uh, Roberto Martinez and then come out second half and, you know, showed real intent, passing was a lot crisper with, uh, you know, more decisiveness, getting the ball out wide, having shots and, you know, Ross Barkley, aggressive 1v1, ball went out wide and there was only one thing in his mind when he, when he got the ball back, one touch, another touch to set and then bit fortuitous on the on the deflection but I think for a thorough they deserved and then uh, they kept going they didn't sit off kept going for about 10 minutes but then as you know in football swings and roundabouts uh, momentum Bournemouth came back into it a little bit but uh, Everton managed to kill the game off with a with a not so good corner but a great <laughs> flick from Gary uh, Gareth Barry and uh, you know Romelu won't score a, an easier goal I don't think this season. For more than one reason, the pivotal moment of the game was the penalty incident, wasn't it? I think so. Uh, James McCarthy had already been booked and we, we discussed it in the, in the commentary. And uh, His arm seemed to move towards the ball. Uh, we, we saw that and uh, I don't think the, the only person that didn't see it or thankfully. wasn't aware of it, <laughs> thankfully, was, was the referee, Martin Atkinson. But he would have been aware of that at half-time and uh, James came out in the second half you know, he's, he's full throttle, full blooded, and throws himself into tackles. Can can find himself on the end of the, you know, wrong. Maybe a pullback, being out of position, but great performance mentally from him in the second half. Uh, very disciplined, and but still managed to maintain that high level of, of performance. James Beattie did okay for Everton, didn't he? And I don't mean the commentary of Bournemouth. I mean as a player. No, he was very good. Um, really good target man, Beats. 
you know, held the ball up really well, brought other players into the game, which is a vital ingredient in any football side. So, yeah, he done really well for us. He was more than just a goal scorer, wasn't he? Who were the... Who were the good poachers, the good goal scorers that you played alongside? Fortunate to play with a, a lot of decent poachers, actually. I mean, Kerry Dixon, a uh, terrific goal scorer in my early days at Chelsea. Um, Dean Saunders, I played with at Sheffield United. He was a very good goal scorer. TC, when I got to Everton, was uh, a, a, a very, very clever finisher. Um, but I think the one man who stands out for me is probably Clive Allen. You know, I think at one, one year he scored 49, 50 goals, was it, at, at Tottenham? And he, I'd got him in his latter years at Chelsea and he taught me an awful lot. He used to stay behind after training and he's, he was clinical on his left foot, his right foot, it didn't matter. We used to do little sessions. I was good on my right foot, so was Kerry Dixon, so was Gordon Jury. But Clive Allen was equally as good on his left as he was on his right. Terrific goal scorer. And he liked the goal against Everton as well, did Clive Allen. And that's it from us for a few minutes. Enjoy the adverts or pop the kettle on. We'll be back very shortly when we'll hear from the boss on the break in Dubai. We feature a very special little boy who needs our help. And we bring you the latest victory for Everton under-18s. Welcome back to part two of this week's programme. Well, the manager and the first team squad have been getting some sun on their backs this week. They've been training hard, or so I'm assured, while they've been away from their regular surroundings. And Roberto Martinez on this very sofa last week told us a bit more about the benefits. Well, it is very important and I think you get the benefit of being together 24 hours a day and uh, in first and foremost you can refocus in what's uh, in the season. Uh, you're going into the final third of the campaign and it's important that mentally we're refreshed but we're refocused. And then the other aspect is the, the opportunity of working with players, as I say, constantly um, for a period of six, seven days, uh, especially for the injured players, the players that are coming back from injury that they need a bit of a... Uh, extra extra work, other players that they need a bit of an individual um, um, program is a, is a perfect opportunity to do all those things with uh, a bit of a uh, warm weather training which is get, gets a real benefit for the group. We've done it last season, we went to Qatar, we came back uh, with, a, with a very good uh, response in the final third of the season and two seasons ago we went to, to Tenerife which is, was a very beneficial and we're looking forward now Dubai is a completely different environment with uh, good facilities so it's going to be the perfect way of preparing the final third of the competition. Be an ideal period of time for somebody like Omar Niaswona to really integrate himself into the group. Especially, especially uh, a, new, a new phase in the group to, to be able to spend some time with with all the players is, is invaluable. Um, I think as a footballer you get a lot more understanding when, when uh, as human beings you interact and you get to know each other and you become good, uh, uh, good, good people and good friends. Um, Uma probably is, is someone that is going to benefit more than anyone because he speaks very good English and the time that we can spend together is going to be uh, extra productive. But it is, it is an important time for the whole team to, to refocus and get, get refreshed at the same time. What's your take on mid-season breaks, Diamond? And actually, no, you're a fan of them because you've just had one yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to come out with that, Daz. I mean, I can't, I can't disappear. I can't have two or three days <laughs> off without it coming back to haunt me, can I? But no, I, I don't have any objection to them mm. whatsoever. I think it's a good opportunity, as the gaffer said there, for everybody to get together, get away from the pressures of the Premier League, um, go and get some good, good weather. You can train first thing in the morning, last thing in the evening if you want to. Double sessions are there to be had. I'm sure the lads will go out and have a couple of meals together and a couple of beers at the right time. Game of golf, potentially. Mm -hmm. And it's a good opportunity for them to spend some time. Uh, and as we said there, Omar Nias as well, to, to integrate into the group. You know the gaffer, you know Dennis Lawrence, Graham Jones and Duncan. The boys will be working out there, won't they? Well, they will. They will. I mean, you, you know, when the time's ready to work, you know, you, you knuckle down and you get it done. And uh, you know you're going to get a good sweat on, which makes you feel good as a player as well, to feel like you've done some work. Um, but then there's time to relax as well, so enjoy that. Did you have mid-season breaks when you were at Chelsea and Everton? I did, yeah. I mean, I've, I've been at Everton about three months and I've been to Magaluf, Dublin, <laughs> Benidorm, I think. <laughs> but that was Howard Kendall, so uh, that, was, that probably wasn't the, the sort of thing the lads will be doing this year. It's perfect for somebody like Umar Nias, as I touched on with the gaffer, isn't it? To yeah. try and get to know the rest of the lads. Yeah, and it's important. Um, he, he speaks the language very well anyway, so that, that, that's not an issue. But just spending time with players on a 24-7 basis is, is good for him. Um, 
I don't know if they you have room partners these days. I think everybody has their own room, but uh, you know, a chance to build some bridges and, and, and see how he gets on with certain people, talk about football. Have they got to win their next game though when they get back? Well, that's always the pressure, isn't it? You know, you go away and have these mid-season breaks, but the pressure's on to win your next game because if you don't, everybody questions the reasons behind it. It's Aston Villa, so we shall see. Well, Everton Football Club has joined the appeal to find a stem cell donor for nine-year-old Kieran Fairclough after inviting the brutal youngster to Finch Farm recently. Kieran, who suffers from diamond black fan anemia, relies heavily on blood transfusions and medicines to keep him stable. His only hope of a long-term cure is a stem cell transplant to replace damaged bone marrow that can't currently produce enough blood cells. Kieran, his dad Graham, his sister Chloe, headed to Finch Farm recently to meet some of the guys. He was born eight weeks early and then it come about that he had this illness called uh, Diamond Black Fan Anemia. So uh, there's only 600 cases in the world. Up until a couple of years ago he was doing fine on the medication and then uh, it's only recently the medication started not working as well as what it what it was and he's relying on blood transfusions to keep him going at the minute. You know, we obviously we're looking for the bone marrow transplants for a long term solution. Finn was here last year and Finn was, was very fortunate. Hopefully we can help everybody else as well. You know, it's, it's a really difficult time. We understand you know, the difficulties that the families are going through and the worry and the, and the pressure of finding a donor. But hopefully uh, when we put it out in the public domain, maybe you know, we can find another donor that will we'll be able to help Kieran. What you do at antinolan.org, you order a sample. Uh, all you do, you get a stick out, you put a bit of saliva inside the tube, send it back off to them. They, what they'll do, they'll put all your data on the, on the system and then hopefully if you're a match, then they'll contact you. It's something that'll take literally two minutes, you know, just to take a swab from the inside of your mouth, send it away uh, and, and get it uh, assessed there. And if you are a donor and you can come forward, all well and good, you know, it, it, it's nothing. You know, it takes simply a minute of your time. If you was selected as a match for somebody, it's it's not, you know, you don't have to go through any big operation and anything like that. It's literally a day case, you know what I mean? So you'd be in for a few hours and, and then back out, you know what I mean? So that's all it is. There's no big operations, you know, you don't have to you know, take weeks off work. You can go back to work the next day, you know what I mean? It's literally a couple of hours out of your life could save a life. Well, it's something that we all need to, to be aware of and, and hopefully uh, we can find a donor for, for not just Kian but for many of the, the kids who are in the same position. It's so humbling, isn't it, Graham, to know that as a football club we can play such a big part in getting the message out there that can potentially save the life of a young boy. Very much so. I mean, we're in a perfect position as a Premier League football club to raise awareness to, and to help these people and everybody around it to, to become aware of, of, of these situations. And it's, uh, you know, it's important as well. It's not, you know, young Kieran you know, suffers from it, but his, his family are very much attached to it as well. And that's what you've also got to remember. It's not just you know, the, the, the ill individual. Mm. It's his family and his surroundings. Well, hopefully the little visit to Finch Farm would have cheered him up. We enjoy getting involved in, in charitable projects. And I, I want to mention a guy that was down at Bournemouth at the weekend, and it was quite cold down there, but he was just in his usual match day attire, yeah. swimming cap and a pair of trunks. Doesn't, doesn't feel the cold speed, oh Mick, does he? <laughs> but uh, no, terrific effort from him as well to walk down from London down to Bournemouth, you know, to raise funds again. You know, that, that magnificent effort and... Uh, He's becoming uh, more well-known than any other player, Speedo Mick, isn't he? <laughs> We're looking at the boys there training. Romelu Lukaku training indoors with gloves, three-quarter length trousers, a snood, and there's Speedo yeah. Mick braving the elements in a pair of speedos. interesting conversation, that one, wouldn't it? <laughs> Romelu and Speedo Mick. You've been out, out and about this week in the community doing some, some coaching, haven't you? Yes, myself and Snods went down to Rainhill High School and took some under-9s, under-14s, under-12s. Um, boys and girls mm. overlooked some coaching sessions that they've been through. Um, they're a very uh, competitive and successful academy down at Rainhill, but it's, uh, it was the Blues that turned up. There's predominantly Liverpool, but it was the Blues who turned up to overlook it all. Good. Diamond and Snods flying the flag again. Well, Everton under-18s narrowly missed out on the northern title of the Premier Academy League, finishing second to Manchester City. But that was still plenty sufficient to see them through to the final playoff league. Now, the top four in the north have been joined by the top four from the south, and each team will play the other once, so that's seven games in total. The boys' final regular league fixture was last weekend when a hat-trick hero saw off Derby County. Nathan Broadhead was the hat-trick hero as Everton under-18s rounded off the first phase of their league campaign with a 3-1 win over Derby. 
The Welsh forward grabbed his first early on, easily slotting home after Shane Lavery's shot had been saved. The second came after half-time when James Yates made for the byline and swung over a cross which Broadhead headed home. Derby came back into it with 10 minutes to go when Luke Thomas sprinted through and finished well. It made for a nervy last part of the game until Broadhead completed his treble with two minutes left, providing a smart left foot finish after good work by Nathan Holland. The win meant the Young Blues finished second to Manchester City on goal difference in the northern section, though the top four teams qualify for the second phase of the competition, which begins next weekend. A terrific achievement again for the 18s Diamond to reach the playoff stage again, and let's hope they can go on and win it. Yeah, it'd be nice, wouldn't it? Because, uh, you know, we've got a real good set of coaching staff down at uh, Finch Farm, and these young lads are getting the best opportunity as they could possibly have to take that extra step and get themselves up towards first team level. And uh, they're winning. They've got that winning mentality as well. Um, I, I know they didn't quite win the league. We finished second in the, uh, the initial league, but that's not to say that we can't win the playoff league. Your old mate John Edwards done a smashing job since he took his turn in coaching the 18s. He has, yeah. I mean, I think to, the coaches alternate, don't they, between the groups. Um, but John's taken over at under-18 level. He's experienced himself, John. He knows his job inside out and uh, clearly he's doing a very, very good job alongside most of the rest of the coaches there. As I said earlier, the top four from the northern section will now join up with the top four from the southern section, play each other once, seven games. So it'll be tough for the boys to come out on top. Well, it will, but it's another test for them and another part of their progression. So I'm sure John will be overlooking it, as will everybody else down at the training ground, to, to make sure that first and foremost they're progressing as individuals and, and as a side they maintain that winning ability. There might be a few uh, rough patches along the way, but that's all part of their learning process. We featured the under-18s quite a lot on the Everton show and we've seen some, some good goals. Lovely hat-trick there from Nathan Broadhead. Yeah, he played well, didn't he? Um, always terrific to get, uh, to get a hat-trick under your belt. Um, nice composed finishes there. Some good build-up play uh, you know, along the way as well. And what's nice to see as well, when they, you know, they're tuning up and it's nice and comfortable, all of a sudden Derby get themselves back into the game. But they've got the character to see the game through and break away and take the right pass, pick out the right pass at the right time and the finish with a plum from young Nathan as well to make it 3-1. We say it regularly in commentary, 2-0. It's an awkward yeah. scoreline at times, isn't it? Because the next one could be game on or it could be game over. Exactly, and that's why I make the point, you know, it's even at under-18 level, you've got to learn from those experiences and how to see out a game of football. And, and clearly John and his players have done that very well. We'll follow the under-18s right through their final playoff stage. And that brings the curtain down on Act 2 of this week's programme. After a brief interval, we'll be back with our big interview. And taking centre stage this week is our former England goalkeeper, Nigel Martin. Welcome back to part three of this week's show. Nigel Martin played exactly 100 games for Everton after joining the club in 2003 from Leeds United. He'd already won his 23 England caps when he arrived at Goodison Park and he went on to make himself very popular with the Evertonians, especially of course during the memorable 2004-05 campaign when we finished fourth in the Premier League table. Big Nigel was back at Finch Farm recently, it was his first visit there by the way, and he sat down with the Everton show. I've seen, uh, seen Aussie, seen Hibbo, seen Unzi. I haven't seen Big Duck yet, but I dare say I'll see him at some point. So it's, it's good to see some good faces. And I know you look back on your time at Everton with a lot of affection. I do, I do. Um, yeah, I was, uh, I was rotting away at Leeds at the time and uh, very, very pleased to get the, get the call and you know, enjoyed my time here. And you signed at the same time as Kevin Kilbane, James McFadden and Franny Jeffers. And thanks to Franny, sneaked in really. Yeah, we did. You know, Franny was the big story, obviously, coming back to his, uh, his club where he did so well the first time. So, uh, you know, he, he took all the headlines and then the, the other three, we sort of uh, sneaked under the radar. What did David Moyes say to you to entice you to Everton Football Club in the first place? Um, <clears throat> he couldn't guarantee me first team football, is the first thing he said. Um, he did say that Richard had a problem with his knee and um, would be going in for an operation at some time. And if I came in and did well, then he would keep me in the team. So... You know, you take somebody at their word and, you know, that was that was a lot better than what I was getting offered at Leeds. So, you know, the, the chance of playing again was, was the important thing for me. And you retained 
your top class form as well, didn't you? The toffees, the supporters took to you straight away. It did. I, I even though that I had like over a year at Leeds where I wasn't playing, I still in that time worked really hard and, and made sure I kept sharp and, and ready in case something came along. And obviously coming to a new club, um, you have to win over a new set of supporters and teammates. So that makes you up your game certainly. And uh, you know, I came in and you know, luckily enough, the you know, first season was a bit of a struggle, um, but I managed to uh, to do okay. And uh, yeah, fans took to me, and that's great. You were always destined to sign for Everton eventually, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, eventually. I got here in the end, obviously, um, you know, 96. So, you know, things transpired. Um, you know, it, it, it was one of those things, you know, it probably, it was a difficult time, I think, here at, at that time. Um, so I think that was probably why um, sort of miscommunication and things happened. And, uh, you know, I went, I went across the Pennines and, and Leeds couldn't have been more welcoming. And, you know, I had, I had a good time over there too. As you say, you came here eventually. 2004-05, for Everton Football Club to finish fourth and qualify for the Champions League. That must be up there with your, your finest achievements in the game. Absolutely. You know, with, with the squad we had, um, you know, people, if you're, if you're looking from the outside in, would look at this squad and sort of say, yeah, they'd be, you know, probably fighting relegation again. So to get off to the start that we did uh, was important. And, you know, it was based around a strong sort of defensive unit, if you like, so the the back four in front of me and, and the five from midfield worked tirelessly, really. Um, made my job a lot easier and, uh, you know, we'd, we'd try and score on the, on the break if we could. David Moyes liked his teams to defend from the front and in that respect, Marcus Bent came here with very, very few expectations, certainly from the supporters. He was effectively replacing Wayne Rooney, who we'd lost in the summer, but Bent, he'd done a terrific job, didn't he? He did. I mean, he, he, I, I don't know how many goals he scored, I guess somewhere around a dozen, something like that in the season. It wasn't, you know, a huge amount, but, you know, we as a team, we didn't score many goals, but, you know, thanks to his hard work from the front and the, and the midfield guys, you know, working their socks off too, um, you know, we didn't concede too many either, so... It was all about momentum that season, wasn't it? Once we got going and got on a run, the belief automatically followed that we could actually trouble the top four places. Yeah, it's. It, I think any season, if you get a good start, it breeds confidence, and and you know, in in any sport, if you, if your confidence is high, you you do better. And um, you know, the the manager had us well organised, and um, we we all knew what what our jobs were. And, uh, you know, we tried to do them to the best of our ability. When the time came to hang up your gloves, as it were, did you know that it was the the right time, the right thing to do? Um, I, to be honest, I'm probably the same as most blokes. I just want to keep go on playing as long as I could. Um, the ankle was obviously an issue. I'd been playing probably for about three months in quite a bit of pain. Um, but, you know, trying to get enough points because we were struggling that season against relegation a little bit. So... I think we'd, we then went on a run and won two or three games in a row. And I remember the manager saying, right, OK, we're safe enough now. You know, go and get your ankle sorted. And we all just thought it was just going to be a clear out and something fairly simple. But, um, you know, after a, a lot of investigation, you know, there was a, an obvious stress fracture there, which, which <laughs> explains why it hurts so much every time I was kicking the ball and running around you. Yeah. That 2005-06 season was always going to be difficult after the tremendous season we had before. The defeats in Europe against Villarreal and then... Bucharest, were, 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 they killed us, didn't they? They did, and that's that's the same thing. You know, you, the season before we started so well, um, and confidence was high, and that's why we did so well. And and then the following season, you know, we we gave Villarreal a really good run. Um, I just think we were a little bit undercooked at the start of the season. We could have probably have done with another two or three weeks before we played them. And I think, you know, the, the outcome of that sort of contest might have been different. We just we got caught cold at home and and. A disappointing sort of two-one loss, um, but we went over there and gave them a real scare. And you know, we all know about Duncan's header. Mm -hmm. um, you could still look and try and find where the foul was, but uh, you, no, won't, no, you won't find it. You won't find it. No, it was one of those things. Um, so it was disappointing. And then Bucharest absolutely blew us away. You know, I don't, I don't know what they were on that day, but uh, they certainly had a lot more energy and and focus and whatever it was but the, you know they, they really blew us away You play behind Alan Stubbs and David Weir two experienced central defenders I take it you're not surprised that both of those guys have done well in their coaching and management careers No no very very you know you, you don't play in the Premier League you know, at centre half at their ages without you know gaining a lot of knowledge and, uh, and, and idea of how the game should be played and uh, you know they were both 
sensible guys. They were both brave. They're both intelligent footballers, and you know they were obviously the right sort to go in, into management afterwards. And it's good to see them doing well. And it probably won't surprise you to learn that Thomas Graveson lives in Las Vegas with a reputed £80 million fortune. Um, no, it wouldn't surprise <laughs> me. I don't think anything would surprise me with Thomas. He was uh, an eccentric character, to say the least, but, but much loved amongst the teammates. So. What a footballer. Yeah, he was. He was um, as good as anyone dribbling with the ball. He, could, he, you know, he, he wasn't blessed with great pace, but... I don't many, know many people who could actually dribble as quickly as he could, and and he, you know, any team needs somebody who can beat a man with the ball, and and once you know, once he did that, you know, he was a big, big influence on our uh, good season that we had. We ever tempted to go down the coaching road, Nigel, when you finished playing? Um, it was a bit difficult, obviously, with my ankle to start with. You know, striking a ball is is always going to be difficult because the ankle, the, the stress fracture, will never heal. So um, that's probably from playing on for three months while it was uh, it never really got a chance to heal so um, striking a ball was difficult but I did I did do sort of two or three years with Bradford City um, just on a sort of part-time basis helping them out because I just feel you know you've got a lot of knowledge to impart to other younger goalkeepers and that that should be a sort of rite of passage really you should be passing on what what I've learned um, you know to others so it's something that uh, I enjoy doing um, but it's, it, I'm a little bit limited of what I can do, really. Or tempted to follow another of your teammates, Kevin Kilbane, down the media route. Yeah, Killers, um, he seems to be on every, uh, <laughs> every show, um, be it radio or TV. Um, again, I, just, I didn't really want to, to be committing my whole, all my time to that. You know, I wanted to spend a little bit more time with my family and things like that that you know, I've missed out on doing you know, in 20 years of, of being a professional. So... Um, it, it, it would just be a little bit too time-consuming, I think, for me. Just finally, Alan Ball was right, wasn't he, Nigel, when he said, once Everton Football Club touches you, nothing's ever the same again. No, absolutely. It, it, you know, I, I was here for a short period of time. Um, I loved every minute of it. You know, you became in, you know, part of the fabric of the club, you know, the supporters and the staff and everybody. And, uh, you know, we've been left uh, with you know, both my children support Everton and look for their results. And... Uh, you know, and it's it's the first one I look for as well, and uh, you know that's that's a testament to to the club. I enjoyed seeing Nigel Martin again. He's a he's a top guy, isn't he? He is, yes. I mean, I, I don't know Nigel very well myself personally, but you can see he's a a really good character, good stock, ultra professional. You know, and you, you know, you mentioned it there in the in the, in the video. You know, you got Stubbsy and David Weir in front of him as well. You look at those three and. As a player, looking around the dressing room and seeing the experience of your goalkeeper and these two centre halves, it fills you with so much confidence. I know you've got experienced, you know, good professionals like that in your side. He was a great keeper as well. He was a really good goalkeeper as well. Was, you know, shot stopping and dominating his his area as well, which was is really important. I mean, when I played here with Neville Southall, he was probably as good as it gets at dominating a, a penalty box. But it's not just that. It's it's organising your back four. It's communication. There's so many aspects to being a good goalkeeper. And Nigel was certainly one of them. They say you don't have to be mad to be a goalkeeper, but it helps. <laughs> certainly did in Neville's case, but maybe not Nigel. Yeah, well, he looks like one of the sensible ones. <laughs> nice, doesn't he? But um, I think Neville was as mad as it comes for, for any Everton goalkeeper. So I, th I think we, we had a little bit of time off after Ni um, Nev. Best keeper you ever played with? It has to be Nev, without a shadow of doubt. Um, he was eccentric. He could win games of football. And I've said this all along. You pay £40, £50 million pounds for strikers should be paying them for top goalkeepers as well because they save you as many points as your, goal, uh, as your goal scorers get you. A good goalkeeper can win you the league, can't it? Oh, of course. Well, you only have to look at Arsenal. Look at the difference in Arsenal th mm. this season. You know, they're still in with a shout of winning the Bartley's Premier League and a lot to do with that is the fact that they've got a really top goalkeeper in Pedacek. You played in the Premier League for a good number of years, Graham. so you played against all the good goalkeepers. Is it on your mind as a forward player that the opposition goalkeeper is out the top draw? For example, when it's a one-on-one, -on -one, are you thinking... This is Peter Schmeichel here. This is Nigel Martin here. Well, you try, you try not to think about that as you're going through. Um, but, you know, I've played against some really good ones. David Seaman, he was, I was one-on-one -on -one with him and sent him down the road for a bun and <laughs> took it around the other side and scored. I enjoyed that one for us. Um, but, no, listen, there, there's some really, really good goalkeepers around. And, uh, you know, f thankfully, we've had a good few along the way.
Nigel was great. Big Nev the best, though, I agree with you. Yeah. And that's it for part three of the Everton Show. After a short break, we'll be back for our final segment of this week's programme, when we'll hear a lot more from Graeme Stewart. We'll be joined on the sofa by Everton ladies manager Andy Spence, and we look ahead to next Tuesday's Premier League visit to Villa Park. Welcome back to the fourth and final part of this week's programme and it's a pleasure to be joined by the Everton ladies manager Andy Spence. Welcome to the Everton show Andy. Big week for the ladies, always is. FA Cup week, Nottingham Forest on Sunday. What do we reckon? Yeah, it's, um, it's always exciting. Obviously we're in our pre-season programme at the moment but because of the way the, the FA Cup competition runs um, we, we entered it in the third round which we progressed by beating Stoke. Um, 7 0, and then obviously we've got Mats Forest this weekend. So it's always good for the players to obviously have competitive games, even though obviously we're building for the league programme at the end of March. Um, but as I say, that competitive edge just brings that extra edge to training, and the build up's been really good so far. So yeah, we're really looking forward to it. We want any team in the Royal Blue Jersey to win FA Cup games, Graham, don't we? Of course we do, yeah. No exception with the ladies Sunday. I'm sure they're going to be excited by the, the prospect of playing Forest. Good result in the previous round against Stoke. Thrashing them 7-0 was excellent. So, you know, I'm led to believe by Andy here that, um, you know, Forrester is a better side than Stoke, but one we feel we can progress in. Let's hope so. Right, let's watch the Everton ladies in some action. Not match action, by the way, but a series of challenges that we set them at Finch Farm last week, starting with the traditional hit the bar. Yes. Next challenge is team keep your challenge. How long can the team keep the ball up? Part of our team challenge is who's got the most accuracy in their strike and is able to hit the mannequin in the head. I think the groundsman did find most of the footballs from your efforts there, Andy. <laughs> they look a competitive bunch. Yeah, um, and that's something we've spoken about. You know, obviously going into into any new campaign, you want the team to be really competitive, and whether that's, as you say, even a, a competition which is obviously 
Uh, a bit of a fun element to it. You still want to see who's the winners in the group. And yeah, I was uh, very disappointed with my own performance. But pleasingly, uh, in the players, that's the key bit. Is they show, obviously, their ability. And I think we saw the, a snapshot of, of it there. Absolutely. Some good technical ability, Graham. I was going to say, just looking at the keepy-ups, you can tell players straight away if they've got good technical ability when they're doing the keepy-ups and what have you. And some of the girls there look like they were really decent players, Andy, as well. Only when it got to you, mate, that it broke <laughs> down a bit. I've been working on my legs, so I've been keeping it up, you know, with my thighs, yeah. So. It's FA Cup week this week, but the priority this season has got to be to get back into the top division. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think last year was a big learning curve for us, obviously dropping down a division and... It's a, obviously the football's different, there's no doubt about that, you know, I think week in, week out from a physical point of view you get tested um, and I've, maybe that was where we fell a little bit short last season, so obviously the mindset has been how are we going to compete with that, we know we have, as you've seen in the, in the video there, you know, a lot of talented technical players but we've also got to bring that physicality to our game if we're going to compete and be a strong side and so far in the pre-season programme, we've really shown a, a great attitude and desire to want to be that physical side and, and then that will allow us to showcase our undoubted ability. You brought some new faces in during the off-season for the women's game. Have they settled in OK? Yeah, really well and, and three really good characters. I think um, we certainly saw one in the, um, in the video there, Georgie Brougham, um, a highly technical player, good centre-half, again a young player, which is, you know, we've got a very young squad, but... You know, a squad with a bit of experience now from last year as well. Alex, our goalkeeper, brings real good competition. And Jenna Diaz, centre midfield, again, brings that physicality which we were perhaps missing last season. Absolutely. Well, that FA Cup tie this Sunday is at the Witness Rugby League Stadium and starts at 2pm. So as the men's team have no game, why not pop along and support the ladies? I'm sure they'd be delighted to see you. Well, it is a game-free weekend for the lads, but next Tuesday it's back to Premier League action when the Blues go to Villa Park. Now, if ever there's a club in turmoil just now, it's most certainly Aston Villa, a fine club with a magnificent stadium, but their 2015-16 campaign has been little short of disastrous. Nevertheless, Roberto Martinez is still expecting a tough game next week. I think it's a, a really important week. Uh, it's just Aston Villa away, and then we've got West Ham at Goodison in a very short period of time to be able to fight for six points. I mean, we, all, we all know how, how small the margins are. And... The final 12 games of the season, they are extra significant. Every point will give you an opportunity to take advantage on the table. So clearly the work that we're going to be doing away is, is with, the, with, the, uh, with the Aston Villa game in mind and, and knowing that from that point on is going to be a really important period. Have you been as surprised to see Aston Villa struggling so much as everybody has to see Leicester doing so well? Yes, yes. I don't think it's a... Um, is, 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 um, a one season problem. I think Aston Villa, you're looking at uh, in the same way that you're building something, um, a bit of momentum over the seasons or you're building a, a squad together. I think Aston Villa has been, has been uh, getting damaged in the last three, four years. So it is a surprise that they, they end up in the position they're in at the moment. I just think that probably the, the way they start games, they, they're really uh, strong and fully focused. Probably the goals, they had a bigger effect than they have in other teams. And they've been unfortunate in many, many situations. I think Leicester, they've been refreshing. I think it's something that everyone enjoys. Uh, as a neutral fan, everyone wants to see a team like Leicester collecting the amount of wins that they had. But uh, clearly, is um, is uh, again, the, the reflection of the small margins that the Premier League have brought this season. It's the most competitive league in world football and you wouldn't see uh, a Leicester in any other, other league in, in European football uh, challenging for the title in mid-February. You say small margins and from fifth and sixth down to the lower half, it's still very tight, isn't it? It is. I think now you, it's, it's fair to say when you get into the final third, you can just more or less uh, look into the little groups fighting for different uh, goals. Uh, the top four uh, are more or less fighting for the title. And from there, you got from fifth position down to 12th. Uh, all, those, all those places are really, really open. And from that point on... Uh, Whatever the final position will be in the other positions is just um, small details that not many people can predict at this point. Diamond, there will be a packed away end of Villa Park yet again, and every single Evertonian, I would imagine, will be fully expecting three points against an awful Villa side. Well, yeah, and a, a poor Villa side, especially at home. You know, they've really struggled in front of the home crowd this season. We've been exceptional on the road. Um, we're on a good run of form away from home as well, so I fully expect us to go there and pick up all three points as well. So you would hope that 
as the gaffer alluded to there, they go and work away on, on the bits and pieces out in Dubai, but come back refreshed and ready to hit Villa hard. What's gone wrong with Aston Villa? Again, it's just uh, and it's not just happened overnight. Mm. It's, it's, it's been over the last two or three years. I'm not so sure at, at director level, it's really been, you know, you know, it's really been as it should be. And that's transmitted itself down onto the pitch, unfortunately. When you're in that situation, Andy, at any level, in any league for any team, if you're in that sort of battle, you need your characters to stand up and be counted. It just doesn't look as if it's happening at Aston Villa. Yeah, it's obviously a struggle. And, you know, a run of defeats and a run of bad results is, is always difficult for, for players to take. And you know, it's the job, obviously, of the manager and the coaching staff. But as you say, those big characters in the dressing room to really try and lift the rest of the team and, and hope that you get that turn of luck. And, Obviously, Villa will be looking for that, but obviously, I'm sure the lads will be determined to make sure we go down ahead and get a great result. Thankfully, thankfully, we're looking up the table and not over our shoulders. And that nicely rounds off this week's Everton show. My thanks indeed to Andy Spence for joining us for the final part of the programme and, of course, to the Diamond for jetting back from his mid-season break just in time to take part. Two big games in five days on the horizon now for the Blues and they'll feature heavily on next week's show. So we do hope you'll join us. We'll see you then.